Well, hello friends and welcome to another Ask Zach. Today, we are gonna talk about Dwayne Allman. And specifically, we're gonna talk about the Telecaster years, you know, with the Allman Joys and Hourglass. We're gonna kind of dovetail into the uh, Muscle Shoals session years when he was using a Strat and, uh, and kind of briefly touch on the, uh, the Gibson Marshall tone. But no, this is not a, a you know, a all encompassing, uh, you know, gear look at uh, Dwayne Allman. We're specifically gonna be looking at the Telecaster years. And uh, one of the interesting things is use of fuzz and specifically a fuzz unit that was attached to his Telecaster right here at the control plate, and also how uh, going to a club one night and uh, seeing a band caused him to uh, pick up the slide guitar, and how much of an influence that band was on Dwayne Allman and the rest of the Allman Brothers. All right, so while you're thinking about it, if you haven't done it already, well, please go down in the corner and subscribe. If you've already subscribed, then I appreciate you supporting the channel, and there's multiple ways there's good old tip jar information that's down in the description. Or you can find out about merch at askzack.com. Also on the website, you can find out about Friends of Ask Zach, which is a way to support the channel on a monthly basis. Uh, you get to see the episodes early without commercials. You get some nice Ask Zach uh, guitar picks. These are some D'Andrea uh, special medium heavy picks that I had uh, made up and you get some of these and uh, yeah and at some point we'll be doing some some more you know exclusive content for the uh, friends of ask zach so yeah let's go ahead and dive in all right so just to kind of give you a, a little bit of uh background on on Dwayne. Dwayne was born here in nashville tennessee in 1946 his brother uh greg was born you know a little a little over a year later in 1947 they, uh, you know, their father was killed while they were quite little. And then they, uh, they went to military school and they both got into music and they ended up down in Florida. And that's where they really started getting, you know, bands together and they had the escorts and then they had the Almond Joys, which is kind of a funny name. And, and of course this was during Beatlemania. So if you see pictures from this era, whether it's the escorts or uh, the almond joys, they uh, they have you know kind of very beadly haircuts, and so it's during this time that uh, that Greg, not Greg, Dwayne, that Dwayne starts playing a Telecaster. So we're gonna go ahead and pull up picture number one. Okay, so this is a shot of Dwayne with the almond joys, and uh, and you can see that he's playing a Blackguard Telecaster, but if you look closely, you'll be able to see that it has a Stratocaster neck on it. Now, in different interviews with Greg, Greg talks about at one point, Dwayne selling a, a guitar, a Telecaster that had a hog back neck. So my assumption is that this might be that guitar and he hogged back because it was probably like a 56, 57, you know, uh, V neck or something like that. And, uh, and they decided to call it a hog back. Now, even more interesting than the strat neck, which is of course cool indeed, is what's on the control plate. So if you look closely under the control plate on his telly, you can see there's some type of mechanism. And so what that is, is that's a fuzz unit. So apparently, uh, Dwayne and the band went up to, to New York, went up to the Greenwich Village, and they were hanging out with the Blues Magoos guys, which evidently were really into fuzz. And Dwayne, it rubbed off on Dwayne, and somehow, you know, we don't know whether this was a cannibalized fuzz unit that already existed, or whether this was something that somebody made up in New York. We have no idea. But he had this, uh, you know, this fuzz unit that was on the guitar. So he could turn it off and on whenever he wanted or adjust it. I mean, that's kind of a, a cool idea. So it was a very unusual thing. So apparently the rest of his rig was a, uh, a Vox Super Beetle amp, and at times would also use an Echoplex. And it's also listed that he used Fender 150 rock and roll strings, which are of course, you know, pure nickel. And it was like, 10, 13, 15, 26, 32, 38. 
and that was his uh, string of choice. That was actually his string of choice uh, throughout his uh, his uh, short career. So that's uh, that's photo number one. Now, here let's let's get to to photo number two, and in this one, it looks like it could be the exact same guitar except it has a white pick guard on it. Now it could be a different guitar, we don't know, but still it has a strat neck on it, it's got a Telecaster body, except it's got a white pick guard and it's still got the same fuzz unit on there. All right? So then let's, uh, and, and that's kind of still in the Almond Joy, you know, kind of period. Now here we're gonna get to, uh, you know, picture number three. Now picture number three is from the Hourglass era. This is a different Telecaster. So this you can tell uh, by some of the different pictures that it is a, a, a maple cap, but it still has the fuzz unit on there. So again, this is a definitely a different guitar. And in fact, if we pull it up to uh, picture number four, then we see, you know, a, a closer up and we can see that it's got uh, a three ply, you know, pit guard and it's got a maple cap neck on it. All right. So then during this period of time, uh, you know, there's some shifting inside, you know, of the hourglass and uh, Pete Carr ends up joining the band. Uh, Pete Carr, if you're not familiar with him, he's unfortunately he's since passed away. Uh, but Pete was of course a member of hourglass as a bass player uh, but then went on to be one of the great Muscle Shoals, uh, you know, guitarists who, uh, you know, played on, you know, hits by Bob, Bob Seeger, you know, like uh, uh, Main Street or, uh, you know, a lot of Paul Simon things that were cut down in Muscle Shoals. Uh, wonderful, wonderful player. And uh, so, so Pete Carr ends up joining the band and he's playing bass, and, but he is a guitar player. And so he had a Telecaster. And so let's pull up picture number five. And picture number five is Pete Carr. And you can see how, uh, how, how young he was. And so this is a 1956 Telecaster. And uh, you, know, you can uh, see that it's been uh, you know, kind of hippied up with the kind of hippie stickers and, uh, and such, but otherwise looks you know, fairly stock. Now, this guitar, um, Pete had it for a long time. And in interviews, he even says that Dwayne Allman used that guitar some. And specifically, he said in one interview that he used it for playing slide on. So now we get up to, uh, to picture number six. And this is a much more recent picture of the guitar. Okay. So, uh, it's now owned by a, a family down in Muscle Shoals, people that were friends of Pete Carr. And so here's the guitar uh, just a number of years ago. And uh, you can see it's still got the, uh, you know, the little decals on it and such. But uh, if, we, if we go on to picture number seven, we will see that uh, it has the holes, you know, drilled on it uh, for the fuzz unit. So... Uh, yeah, so this was uh, another one of the guitars that uh, that uh, you know Dwayne used and that uh, you know Pete used on you know tons of sessions in uh, Muscle Shoals and so uh, yeah another uh, really cool important uh, you know American guitar. So all right, so let's uh, so he kind of had this thing of using a Telecaster and a fuzz unit and of course the first Hourglass album was done with a with a Vox amp. The second one was apparently done with a, a Fender Twin. Now, during the Hourglass era, during the, you know, the time the band was still together, they went to a club in Los Angeles and they saw Taj Mahal, okay? So Taj Mahal's guitar players were Jesse Ed Davis and they had just released their first album And on it is Statesboro Blues. Well, Dwayne went and saw Taj Mahal with Jesse Ed Davis play live, and they did Statesboro Blues. And that was where Dwayne got, you know, 
all twisted up around about having to learn to play slide guitar. And, you know, to hear what the fuss was about, well, listen to that Taj Mahal version of Statesboro Blues, and you're going to hear where Dwayne got almost all of his licks on that song. They copied that album, that tune, Statesboro Blues, Taj Mahal's version of it, they copied it verbatim. Now, they did amp it up, and obviously... Dwayne had his own touch and his own tone and everything, but that's where it comes from. It came from, you know, it came from Jesse Ed Davis and Jesse Ed was playing slide on a Telecaster and he was using standard tuning. And that was kind of why I played uh, slide with the standard tuning at the, uh, the intro there. So, uh, yeah. So now there is an alternate story of how uh, you know Dwayne started playing slide that was, that's been told by his brother Greg, which you know the the first story has been told by Pete Carr. The second story is told by Greg Allman. The second story, the second version is that uh, Dwayne was sick, uh, and uh, Dwayne bought him that Taj Mahal album and a uh, bottle of of Coracidin cold medication. And that, you know, that's where it came from. But regardless, uh, you know, it was it was Taj Mahal and Jesse Ed Davis that caused, uh, you know, Dwayne to to get heavily into slide. And so he, you know, he eventually gets the you know the Coracidin bottle. And right now, I have to thank Chad Cox for uh, for sending me a real Coracidin. So you can see it even still has the label on it, and. Uh, I'm very grateful for that. It's it's very neat because if if you've messed with slides, you know that the weight and the thickness of the glass and the feel of it makes a big difference. And so this has a really neat uh, feel to it. So uh, yeah, so this was fun to mess around with. And uh, and I was using my uh, my Analog Man uh, fuzz along with that. So I was just playing the the telly with the core seed and slide into this uh, sun face fuzz into the uh, deluxe, nothing else you know, plugged in. All right, back to Dwayne. So, uh, so of course, Dwayne and Greg are becoming very, you know, disenchanted with what's going on with Hourglass. And so they cut some stuff down in Muscle Shoals, which is like the BB King medley, which is off the, the Dwayne anthology. And it's, you know, you can find it other places, but you can tell the direction that they want to go in and that they will eventually go in, you know, with the Almond Brothers, but uh, the, the label wasn't willing to do it. So Greg is floundering out in LA, Dwayne moves to Muscle Shoals, and by that point, and really tail end of the Hourglass era, you know, Dwayne has shifted to to playing a Strat for some reason. So he's he's gotten rid of the the telly with the uh, attached fuzz on it. And he's now using a fuzz face, you know, pedal that he's gotten. And he's using what looks to be about a 66 strat. So it's, you know, white pick guard, uh, three color sunburst, big headstock with transition logo. And there's tons of pictures of him playing it in the hourglass. And then by the time he's in Muscle Shoals, he's painted the pick guard black. And you know, we know it was painted black because there's, Plenty of shots of him where you can see that some of the black paint has been uh, rubbed off and you can see the white underneath. So in Muscle Shoals, of course, he uh, you know, continues to, uh, to hone in on his slide work and, of course, works on you know, great things like you know, Hey Jude with Wilson Pickett and uh, The Weight with uh, Aretha Franklin. I'm guessing that was cut up in, uh, in, in uh, New York at the Atlantic Studios, but... Uh, yeah, so he cuts all these all these great tunes, mainly using that Strat and the Fuzz, and uh, different reports say that he used. And there's pictures of him using a, a blackface twin that obviously has JBLs because you can see the uh, the silver dome in the center of the speaker shining through. And uh, apparently, he also used a a Princeton at times that he would turn up all the way and put baffles on it, and that was kind of his uh, his rig. And then, of course, uh, you know, by the time you get to the uh, the Almond Brothers, he's uh, he's completely shifted away from the uh, the Fender, you know, and Fuzz sound. And I think it's interesting. I think it, you know because it's like once you hear his sound 
with the Gibson guitars, with the, you know, with the Les Paul or the SG, you know, into the 50 watt Marshall, you know, straight in, uh, it's a great sound. And, uh, and you can see maybe that was what he was kind of going for the whole time. And he was finally able to, to get there, you know, what he'd been trying to do with the telly and a fuzz and other things. But, uh, yeah, his slide playing certainly uh, revolutionary. And I think one of the real interesting things about his playing and his tone is in the Almond Brothers was how much he sounded like an elect uh, like a an amplified harp player, like a you know like a blues harmonica guy that was you know with one of those little bullet mics, uh, you know through a distorted amp. I mean, there's just so many times you know when he plays the intro uh, to an Almond Brothers cut where it, you think, is that harmonica? So uh, really, really neat sound. Uh, really, really great stuff. Uh, I love Dwayne. And uh, so, yeah, so that's why I wanted to do an episode and just wanted to focus on kind of the Telecaster years and him getting into the the fuzz and getting into slide and, and how that all influenced him. So now I need to, you know, kind of give uh, credit uh, and also, you know, kind of give you some stuff if you want to do a deep dive. So first thing uh, I would do if I want to do a deeper dive into Dwayne is I would get the uh, the Sky Dog album. I mean, book by Randy Poe. So uh, Randy's a great writer. He also wrote the uh, Buck Owens autobiography, Buckham, which if you have any interest in Buck Owens, you need to get that. Uh, but uh, this is great. There are other books about the Allman Brothers and about Dwayne, you know, Things that Galadriel and uh, I think Alan Paul, you know, have, have written that that are, are great also. But this is this is the one that I would get first if you haven't read those others. Uh, this is exceptionally well done, and there's also a gear section. And so I learned from this, and also from other old guitar player articles I had. As far as listening, uh, you know, the thing to get is the Sky Dog. So this is a. Uh, seven disc compilation and it is all of the almond joys the escorts you know the hourglass and uh or most of it i should say and then it is almost i think it is almost every single bit of the session work that he did through the years so you have all the wilson pickett clarence carter arthur conley uh king curtis otis rush boz skaggs Ronnie Hawkins, Johnny Jenkins, John Hammond, Delaney and Bonnie, all the Derek and the Dominoes, all sorts of stuff. Uh, this is fantastic, a, a wonderful deep dive. So, yeah. All right, I'll, I'll just mention real quick. I do have the, uh, I do have a copy of the uh, Hourglass double album, which is where I got uh, the photos of him, uh, you know, with the band, where you can see the fuzz attached there, and also the uh, you know, the photo over here where you can see that he's got a three-ply guard on it. There he is. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode, our uh, look at, at Dwayne and his early years, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.